that's okay. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's that time of year again. Um, we're going to talk about um, just redesign and how exciting is that, that we don't have to worry about um, classic um, urine closing. So that's super exciting. Um, here's our agenda this morning. Um, we are going to spend the first hour and 15 minutes just talking about the payroll side of things. Um, and then we're going to take a 15 minute break. And then Amanda um, is going to be covering um, the USAS side of things. So um, out on our wiki page, I'm going to show you where the information is that, that we're um, going to be talking about this morning. So if you go to the SSDT wiki page and you go to SSDT meetings and trainings, um, you should see a page that looks like this. Um, and what we're going to be focusing on um, this morning is um, obviously under redesign, and we're going to focus on the 2022 calendar year end um, information. So on the left side, you're going to see the USAS um, information, and on the right side, you're going to see the payroll side of things. Um, I did want to um, mention, as somebody already pointed out um, this morning, you do not see a, a PowerPoint listed for the payroll side of things. Um, we really tried to um, enhance and put um, lots and lots of detail in our checklist. Um, so if that is something that the if the PowerPoint is something that you guys were using um, on your side of things for um, training on your end, um, please reach out to us and we will certainly um, you know put together a PowerPoint um, if that's something that you um, are missing or needing. Um, but we felt that um, we weren't sure how many people actually use the PowerPoint. Um, and if we really put the, the meat and details into the checklist, that's probably what you're going to be focusing on and using and taking, you know, to use um, with your districts and make it your own anyway. So if this is something that you're, again, that you're going to miss, um, please reach out to us and let us know and we'll, we'll get that PowerPoint up to date and, and put together. Okay, so again, um, we're going to be focusing on the checklist. And throughout um, the checklist, we have links to several other supporting documents that are also listed on this page. Um, so we'll talk about those. Um, and then we have links directly to those resources that um, yourself or even district people um, you know, might be needing. Um, so there's quick links here for them to click on, for yourself to click on um, and access you know, in just um, a short amount of time. I did want to point out that um, the ITC management part of um, calendar year end is going to be held at a later time. Um, so we um, want to get the documentation up to speed and get all the pieces put together before we actually presented it. Um, so we're going to, you know, not be talking about this um, today. And again, if you go to our training um, and uh, registration page, you'll see that you can now register for that December 16th session. And that's when we'll be covering that portion of um, calendar year and closing. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that, that that will be held um, at a later time. I know Michelle is working on the um, documentation side of things for 1099s um, so that, um, you know, that window for you to run a test file through, um, I think she said that's the end of November. So she wanted to get that out sooner um, so you guys have access to that and, and know the steps and so forth that are involved. But we will have the training session on December 16th. Okay. All right. Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started then with our um, calendar year in closing. Again, if you click on that um, checklist link, 
you're going to see that um, at, at the top we have we've listed all the important deadlines. So you know, for federal, state, um, all all the different states, RITA, CCA, your city um, filing deadlines may vary, and obviously we don't. Um, you know, have a handle on every single city throughout the state of Ohio. So, you know, districts know of those deadlines and because they vary, um, you know, we just ask that you check with each individual city. At any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me, um, you know, send a message in the chat, um, whatever works for you, but please don't hesitate to, to reach out at any part, uh, at any time um, throughout. Um, the presentation. Okay, so we're going to first get started on some preliminary um, things that that can be done um, prior to districts even, you know, maybe even beginning to think about W-2 time. Um, so lots of times we don't think about that until after our last pay in December, and that can sometimes be too late. So we do, you know, encourage districts to begin thinking about that now. Um, and there are, um, you know, areas that can be, um, you know, entered, information can be entered in the system now, and then that will cause a little less heartache, um, you know, after the fact, so to speak. So the first um, item on the checklist is to clear or verify that all the COVID fields have been cleared. I'm not sure if any districts reported anything for 2021. Um, we all know that 2020 was a totally different time in our life. Um, but if there would be or a chance that there could be any information in those COVID fields that districts did report for 2021, we do just ask that, um, you know, do a quick check on those fields. Um, it's as easy as going to, um, you know, the, the payroll item selecting the federal tax item from the drop down and then you know obviously if they don't have the covid fields added to their grid those will need to be selected using the more option um, and then just verify that all of those are blank um, if they do need cleared we do have a mass change option that's available so that um, those can just be cleared in a couple steps so if you you know have that um, payroll item, that federal payroll item pulled up, um, you'll select then that mass change option, and then it's going to um, allow you to select that mass change definition um, called clear federal tax COVID-19 fields, and then you just slip, simply click the execute um, option and those values are cleared, you know, like I said, in a couple of clicks. Don't know how relevant that is anymore, but I think one more year we might want to just double check those to make sure that um, you know those amounts are there's nothing in those fields. Life insurance. Um, these were known as your NC1 payments in Classic. Um, so now we just you know we speak English. We're going to call them life insurance. So we do have um, a whole um, step by step kind of outline um, regarding life insurance, how, how to calculate that premium, that cost, and then how to actually process, process that through a payroll. So again, use these links that are in the checklist that are hyperlinked because it's going to give you, you know, all the detail that you need um, to step you through that process. Okay, so once you calculate the cost, those can be processed then through um, payroll payments future or a payroll payments current um, uh, pay type, uh, or I'm sorry, using the life insurance pay type. So again, that document there helps you calculate the cost and then how to process um, those types of payments. Um, adoption assistance. These were known as NC2 payments in Classic. Um, so again, um, you can process those through payroll payments future or payroll payments current. Um, and then you're going to use the pay type um, adoption assistance. Okay. Step four, um, there are times when um, there were reimbursed um, employee expenses. Um, maybe these were reimbursed on the USAS side of things, 
and those need to be um, applied to an employee's W-2. Um, these were known as NC-3 payments in Classic. Um, again, there is a, a document called Reimbursable Employee Expenses that kind of steps you through different scenarios and then different options um, within those scenarios. So um, depending on how you want it to appear on the employee's W-2, um, you know, go through the different scenarios and then um, find one that fits and then um, choose, you know, the option that best, um, you know, suits that specific scenario. Okay. Again, um, think, you know, ahead of, ahead, outside the box, ahead of time, because a lot of these, the steps are easier if you can process it through, you know, a payroll before the end of the year. Okay. Number five is just, um, you know, verifying that those OSDI codes um, are listed on those specific payroll item configuration um, records. So it's as easy as going to the payroll item configuration screen. You can even filter the grid um, by the type of OSDI, and then you're going to open those OSDI records and make sure that there is a, a code listed first, and then followed by any description um, of that OSDI record. Um, but again, we want to make sure that the code is listed first. This is required. Okay. Um, within this step, we do have a link to the um, OSDI codes. So the new rates um, that were effective this year, but then you can also search and find any school district um, income tax uh, code that might you might be looking for, okay? So that's that is step five. Um, along that same lines, we do ask that you verify your um, W-2 abbreviations on your city records. So again, you wanna make sure that that abbreviation um, is listed. Um, the fir first eight characters are what's gonna print on the employee's W-2. Um, just a little note, because I feel like this is just slightly different than Classic was, if this field is left blank, then the abbreviation value is what will print. So, you know, there's on those city records, there's the W-2 abbreviation field and then the abbreviation field. So if this is, is the W-2 abbreviation field is blank, then it's going to default and print the abbreviation value. So you can quickly, you know, Ver verify these city records by going to, um, again, the payroll item configuration screen. Um, you can then um, filter the grid by the type equaling city um, and then verify that W-2 abbreviation column on your grid to make sure there is a, a value in that W-2 abbreviation field. Okay, so those gr grids are wonderful and super easy way to check um, this information, you know, all in just a couple clicks instead of going record by record and opening up and verifying and so forth. The city tax entity code uh, codes um, for any city um, that is going to be reported electronically, and I don't, I'm not sure of how many cities aren't um, reporting electronically these days. I feel like that's, you know, obviously the wave of the future, um, but in order for those records to be reported correctly um, electronically, there does there there has to be a tax entity code. Um, so on that payroll item configuration screen, um, you're going to want to open each of those um, city tax records that are to be filed electronically, and then verify that the appropriate code is entered in that tax entity code field. OK, so we just have a note and, you know, kind of in bold, this information cannot be um, submitted electronically unless that text entity code is present. So you do want to make sure that that's um, listed. Hey, Lori. Yes. This is Andrew with WOCO. Can yes. we verify what the tax entity code is? Yeah, so uh, from what I understand, it's the FIPS code. It is. You're, that is correct. 
And okay. It, yes. Is it, is it possible to put a link to that yeah. on yeah. here? Yep. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great idea. I will make a note of that, and we will add that. And can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, so do we know if the OSDI reconciliation on the business gateway, is that due the same time that the Ohio State tax filing is due? Like there's an annual school district reconciliation. Yeah, right. I feel like it is. I, I've been removed from that for a little while. Um, it always was. I can try to look quick if we... You know what? I'll make a note of it, Andrew, and I'll I will follow up with you. I don't want to waste everybody's. I don't want to okay. trying to find it, but I do think that it's um the same time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks for the questions. Okay, so um, moving on then to Rita. Um, so any. Um, city that reports to um, Rita, so that third party that's managing those city um, payments. You do have to verify a couple things um, um, on that those city um, records, the payroll item configurations, and those are um, one being that there is a value in the um, Rita uh, the code. So the RITA assigned code must be in the RITA um, code field. And then the de RITA defined description must be in the RITA description field. So these are you know, set by RITA themselves. Um, and then you want to make sure that those two um, fields, based on their you know, information, is provided um, on those um, payroll item configurations for those cities that are reporting to RITA. So we do have a link here that's going to take you right to um, RITA's website, and that, that will give you then um, a list of those codes and descriptions, um, you know, and how they want those values entered. The other part to this is for those employees having this city tax withheld, um, the Employee or residence um, deduction type has to be populated on their payroll item screen. So there's two parts to this. The payroll item configuration is the actual setup of for the city record. Um, those values, the code and the, de the description have to be entered. And then likewise, those employees that are having this withheld, those have to be um, have their deduction. Um, type value set as well. Okay, so you can go to the payroll item grid and um, select, you know, those that city under the drop down, and then make sure that that deduction type um, column is added to your grid. And you can actually easily see um, and make sure that everybody's deduction type is defined. Okay, so it's a quick way to check that again. Love the grids, okay? Likewise, for those cities reporting to CCA, um, they're a little more complex. Um, we all know that, you know, both of them can't be the same, sort of like STRS and SCRS. One has to be just a little more difficult. Um, but again, um, on the payroll item configuration city records, for those that are reporting through CCA, um, you have to make sure that the uh, CCA assigned code is entered in the CCA field, um, along with the CCA description. Um, and then the report to CCA checkbox is marked. Okay, so that's the first part. <laughs> um, they also have these wonderful appendix, um, A, B, and C. Um, and those... Um, kind of dictate how additional payroll item configuration city records need to be set up, okay? So I did include here um, the appendix, or I'm sorry, the pages for those appendices are 130 through 134. 
Um, also, here's the link then um, to that specific those that specific part um, in of the on the CCA's website. Um, so we've outlined here um, what how those records those payroll item configuration records need to be set up based on what you find in those different appendix. So if the CCA city is in appendix A, you'll need to fill in on the payroll item, excuse me, payroll item configuration for that city, the valid CCA code, the valid CCA name, and then check the box report to CCA. If any city is not in, in Appendix A, but it's in Appendix B, then you have to fill in the, a valid CCA code, a valid CCA name, and you uncheck the report to CCA box. And then lastly, if any city is not in Appendix A, B, or C, you should have, um, you should leave the CCA code field blank you have to enter the valid CCA city name, and then likewise, you leave the report to CCA box unchecked. The valid CCA name has to follow what you find in this link here. So it's it, the long, there's a long name for it now. It used to be called the finder. Most of you might you know, know it by that shortened name, but we do have a link here that tells you exactly what the city, what CCA needs the city name to be. Okay, so that's the payroll item configuration part. Um, again, the, the other part to that is to make sure that the employee, your employees have um, that deduction type of either employment or residence set as well. So my suggestion is, just to have this deduction type marked for all your city records. Because I know that um, it does get a little, it's not gonna hurt anything, um, you know, but it is very important for W-2 reporting, okay? Likewise, CCA is very particular when it comes to your employees' addresses. And I know there were several files that got rejected in the past because of it not meeting um, the postal um, specifications. So again, um, we have a link here to um, the, the US Postal Service and then guidance on um, entering employee addresses, okay? So they're a little more particular. Um, I did wanna mention that we did receive some information regarding the submission side of um, CCA. Um, we're sort of, you know, out of the loop when it comes to like uploading the file, um, but we did receive some information and hopefully all of you um, have received this um, as well. Um, their submission process, you know, once you get the file from our system, uploading that file to CCA was um, I'm sorry, they didn't allow you to upload the file. You had to burn it on a CD. There was a whole encryption process that had to go that you had to go through. It was sort of a nightmare, right? Um, so we did receive word that um, they're no longer accepting a CDs, um, and you will actually be uploading that file to CCA. And there's an actual encryption process that you'll go through. Um, after you've uploaded the file. So unfortunately, I don't know much more than that. Um, you guys might know more, have more information than I do on that. But I do know that that side of things, as far as getting the file to CCA, um, they've made that process um, easier. So um, hopefully you guys all have that information. Um, so that will, that will be a little less painful. Okay. Moving on to step 10 then, um, any HSA um, payroll item configurations, we want to make sure that that annuity type is set to other. So again, you can easily um, you know, look at the payroll item configuration um, grid 
and make sure that those um, uh, annuity types are set to other. Um, we've also tried to include in the documentation or in the checklist, um, you know, where we're entering this information, then where does it get placed on the W-2? So in this case, your HSA um, amounts get placed in box 12 with a code W. Um, so we've tried to place those, that little tidbit of information throughout the checklist as well. So if you have any questions about that, you know, it's, it's right there for you to see. Um, when it comes to the W-2 configuration, um, it is super important that this is set up correctly. So if a district is going to be submitting their information um, on their own, there's a checkbox that will need to be entered, okay? So let me show you this quick so we don't have any questions about this. So if you go to um, system configuration, there's a W-2 configuration option. So this checkbox up here tells um, the system that the district will be submitting um, their information on their, their behalf. So it's the ITC is sort of out of the out of the picture. Okay. When this box is checked, the um, submission files are named slightly different. And we'll talk about that when we get to the creating your submission file part. Um, so this tells the system they'll be submitting their own files. And then here, you want to make sure that your company information is listed, the contact information is listed, the submitter EIN, super important, and the user ID, super important. If the submitter information is the same as the company information, you can simply check the box and it will automatically populate the values below based on what's been entered um, at the top of the screen, okay? So we wanna make sure that this is set up ahead of time um, so that you don't um, have issues, you know, when you do truly go to create those submission files. And we have a note that, you know, what is the submitter EIN and what is the submitter user ID? Um, this is actually given to them um, when they register with business services online. So these two will, will be given at the time um, of registration with that entity. Okay. Are there any questions when it comes to all sort of the pre um, W-2 processing steps? Lori, just a quick question. Sure. Um, for the CCA, is there a file that is going to be um, available to upload? Can yes, there that? is. Yes, great question. So we'll we'll go through um, a little bit later in the checklist. We're going to step through creating the submission files for all the different entities. So your um, your federal, your, all your states, um, cities, CCA, RITA. Um, we'll step through all of those a little later, but great question. Yes, okay, there's, there is you. a file. Sorry. No, you're fine. So before, I probably confused you, before the file was created from the system, but it had to be transferred onto a CD. And then the CD got sent in the mail to um, CCA. Now the file's still going to be created from the system, but you'll be able to upload that directly to CCA's website. Okay. So I probably confused you. You're good, thank you. Uh -huh. Lori, do you know, are they still going to accept paper if they have only a couple? Uh, my, uh -huh. from what I saw, um, it, they are no longer accepting um, anything through the mail. I, I, if I remember right, it even said it would be rejected. It'd be sent back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, when it comes to month end, um, because this is something that districts do, you know, 12 times out of the year, um, and when it comes to the redesign, there's really not a lot of, um, you know, there's not much to the month end closing procedure. Um, I've put a link here 
Um, this will take you right to the month end checklist. Um, and we're not gonna spend a lot of time going through these steps because hopefully this is something that the district is used to doing, you know, 11 other months out of the year. Um, but if there are any questions about the month end checklist, I'd be happy to, or steps, I'd be happy to go over them. I just, you know, because it's something they do every month and you're not in the redesign, you know, closing anything per se, um, I didn't think we needed to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so we do have the checklist linked here. Um, again, feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'm not trying to, you know, ignore going over something. I just feel like we probably need to get to something they only do once a year. Okay, moving right along then to the quarter end closing. Um, these steps are included um, in the checklist. However, um, we do have a link to the actual quarter end checklist um, right in the, the calendar year end checklist. Um, basically, it's not any different than what they're doing, you know, three other times throughout the year. Um, first being creating their ODJFS report. Um, so again, not anything different than they're used to doing. Um, I think the important um, thing to remember is, and hopefully everybody's familiar with this by now, but when they do um, go to upload the file, they want to make sure that they're selecting the file type as that ICESA. Um, so since it switched to the source, um, that process is a, is a little bit different, um, but hopefully it's, it's been in place for a little while now. So hopefully people are familiar with um, submitting their file to that new, the new way. When it comes to quarter report, um, obviously they're gonna run their quarter report. Every district you know, has a different way of balancing that, um, but a couple things that they wanna make sure um, they do is make sure that the gross, I'm sorry, the calculated adjusted gross um, matches um, what it's expected, the gross minus annuities, um, and then the quarter report has now been updated. So if there is a discrepancy um, in what the system calculates um, versus that manual calculation, that will be um, flagged as an error on the quarter report now. So um, they should pay particular attention to that. Um, they also wanna verify their payables that they balance. So all of the checks um, cut for the quarter should equal all of the payroll items listed um, the totals listed on their, the quarter report. So, you know, what was withheld um, was actually what was actually was actually what was paid. OK, and make sure that they um, don't forget, you know, any electronic transfers for any of those um, payments like you know, your federal, your Medicare um, balance, all of those payroll items listed on that report. The gross, um, the gross on the report. Um, for the quarter should match all of the payroll um, disbursement checks um, that were processed on the USAS side. So, you know, they can easily go to um, the USAS integration um, and go down to the payroll submission and then look at, view the details for the quarter, or I'm sorry, for each payroll in the quarter to, to get a total. Um, on the payroll side, if they're if that's not something they're already tracking on some kind of spreadsheet um, on their own. So I know every district kind of handles their balancing and um, a little differently, but that is an easy way to get the gross for each of those payrolls within the quarter. Okay. And then I'm not sure how many districts print, um, you know, if they're still paper people um, and they like to print hard copies of things. Um, you know, now would be the time to do that. Um, just remember that the quarter report um, and all of those reports, you know, dealing with quarter end, so to speak, processing um, are in the file archive. So if that's something they need to reference back to, um, they're are always out in the file archive for them to access. We do ask that uh, just like any other quarter um, that they balance their W-2 um, information. So, you know, you'll go to um, the 
reports and then W2 reports in submission. Um, and the first thing I would do is, you know, check the box to um, generate the report for errors only. Um, that might even help with quarter end balancing. So if something's not in balance, run the W2 report, check that box to generate the report for errors only and see if that triggers anything. You know, obviously an audit report will help as well, but sometimes this helps pinpoint, you know, who the, the problem children are, so to speak. So that might point you in the right direction. And then obviously view that report, correct any errors, verify the errors, um, you know, if they're just warnings, um, they're okay to, to ignore. Um, and then you'll want to run that report again, um, unchecking the box to report um, only errors and then balance and verify the full report. Okay, we do have a link then to the W-2 reconciliation worksheet. Um, this has been around for many, many moons. Um, I'm not sure how many districts still use this. Like I said, there's probably, there's so many different ways districts balance. They might have their own spreadsheet that they're, you know, putting numbers into to, to balance on a quarterly basis. But um, if, they are wanting to use that um, W-2 reconciliation worksheet that we provide. I have a link to that um, in this step as well. They want to also balance then, as we talked about um, before, uh, all the payroll items um, match to what was paid for the quarter. Um, so all the payments paid match what was is on the W-2 report as well, um, just like the quarter report. And then you also wanna balance the gross um, with all of the amounts, um, all the payrolls that were processed for the quarter. So just like we talked about for the quarter report, you're doing the same thing on the W-2 report. Okay. Um, and we just have you know a note here um, that if there are errors um, that are discovered, you know, some pointers, look at your voided checks, look at error adjustments, um, you know, using going to core and then adjustments. And then lastly, you can run the audit report um, and, you know, for the, um, the quarter and make sure that, or the year, I'm sorry, in this case, and make sure that, um, you know, that might point you in the right direction to figure out where those um, errors are coming from. All right, moving right along then, step 19 is just to make sure that all your um, payables have been um, paid to date. So um, if you've processed everything to date, this, when you go to your outstanding payables, this area should be blank. Um, you know, if for whatever reason, there are payables that you process, that are processed annually, um, something, you know, sort of um, not as common, then obviously those um, outstanding payables are still going to be there. But probably at this time, um, you know, you've paid everything to date and that screen should be empty. Um, you also want to make sure that your employer distribution amounts equal um, the checks that were cut on the USAS side. So what was, you know, processed um, as under the submission option was actually, you know, that matches what was actually paid on the USAS side. And again, you can go to USAS integration, employer distribution, and these test files don't have any um, submission files entered, but you can see in a quick but with a quick look, um, the totals for each of those employer distribution submissions that were then um, processed and those to that total should match the payable that was, um, or the um, disbursement check that was processed on the USAS side, okay? All right, and then um, step 19 is just, oops, I, I did skip something up here on the balancing, um, your uh, 
payroll items, I'm sorry. Um, for city withholdings, you do want to um, verify that the total gross that's listed on the report um, times the city rate matches the tax that was withheld. So that just, you know, make sure everything balances um, and you paid what was supposed to be paid um, to the, those cities. Step 19 then is, um, you know, there's several different forms um, when it comes like outside the system that need to be processed. So it's just a reminder, you know, process your 941, all of those quarter end submission um, forms that um, the districts do outside of the system, maybe using some reports and information from the system, just a reminder to, to get those completed and submitted. Okay. Step 20 is running the OPSI report. So now is a good time to run the OPSI report that districts are gonna be asked to provide um, information later um, after you know, um, calendar year end. Um, but this captures all of the information um, that's needed at, as of calendar year end time. So we do have um, an OPSI report out under the report repository. Um, if that's not something that's already been downloaded, if that report definition is not already existing in districts, um, you know, under their report manager, then they, they can go out to um, the report repository and I can show you where that is, just a quick reminder under help. There's an option called Public Shared Reports Library. And if we click on that, here's all of those shared reports um, for the payroll side. And if we go down towards the bottom, I thought it was the bottom, sorry. This. Oh, right here, I'm sorry. It's under calendar. Um, year-end based reports, here's that OPC report that I was talking about. So um, you simply click on the, the, the file itself, it will get downloaded to your computer, and then you'll go to your report manager, probably all of you know how to do this already, um, and you're going to import that report definition. Okay, so if districts don't already have this um, in their instance, you know, encourage them to download that, um, import it, and then run this report now to save them a lot of headaches later um, when OPSI actually, you know, requests the information. And then again, um, not sure how many districts are still printing copies of anything, um, but we are at the end of the quarter and processing, so to speak. So if they want um, hard copies of their employee master and employee earnings register, um, they can run those two reports and then print those um, for their records. Again, those reports are in the file archive. So it's not something that's, you know, they have to run. Um, they're automatically copied out there for them to access later. Okay. That completes then quarter end. Um, we do have, you know, kind of in bold red um, print, um, if districts are needing to continue on with their January processing, but they're not ready to, you know, process their W-2s, they simply just need to leave December open, okay? They're going to create then their January posting period. They'll make that posting period current, and then they can begin their January payroll. And I know that's super scary. We, you know, you get probably get questions all the time, and you'll get questions this year because that concept is, you know, very different than classic, but it really is that easy. Okay. So if they're not ready to begin their January, I'm sorry, begin W-2 processing, they need to move forward with January payroll. It's as easy as keeping December open, making, creating that January posting period, making it current, and they can keep, keep, 
keep going, okay? Then at any time when they're ready to um, come back and work on their W-2s, we're gonna begin then with step 22. Or if they're a district and they're ready to you know, continue on, they can just you know, keep moving forward with um, W-2 processing and step that, which begins at step 22, okay? All right, so we're gonna get started then with W-2 processing. Um, steps 22 through 28, I did want to point out that these are exactly the same steps that we talked about. Um, I'm going to scroll here, so I apologize. At the beginning, under the pre-calendar year in closing, um, because it's so important that these aren't missed, um, we, we wanted to make sure that you know, if districts didn't have time and it's now past their last payroll of the calendar year and now they're starting to think about W-2s, um, we didn't want them to forget to, you know, look at these um, steps that we talked about in the beginning. So these first, I think, six steps are exactly the same as the preliminary, um, and that's just in place so that they don't forget to do it. OK, so if they didn't do it and it's after the fact, you know, in steps one through six, one through seven, whatever um, the beginning, then there shouldn't be a chance that they miss it. Right. <laughs> They're listed again. OK, so I'm going to not cover these first few items because we already talked about that. Um, again, hopefully it's not too confusing, but it is super important that they you know, do look at those areas. And we all know some don't print the checklist until they're ready to start, you know, W-2 processing and it might be too late. So we put those in there um, two different times so they didn't get missed. So we're gonna start with um, step 29. And that's, um, these next several steps are basically, um, we've tried to outline all those different unique um, types of situations that districts need to um, include on an employee's W-2. Um, and we've spelled out those special situations pretty clearly. Um, so the first being dependent care. Um, hopefully this makes it easy for you to, you know, a district to look at and say, I don't have dependent care. You can skip right past 29. I don't have third-party sick pay. I can skip right past um, step 30. But if they do, we have details within each of these unique special reporting situations that should be helpful, and it spells it out pretty clearly, okay? Dependent care. So if they used the dependent care um, payroll item during the payroll process, the district doesn't need to do anything. Okay, the system handles all of that for them. However, if they aren't, you know, processing it as a payroll item, um, then we're going to need to add an adjustment. Okay, and it steps through, you know, exactly what the adjustment needs to, to look like, um, and then how it actually treats um, the tax part. Okay, I, you guys can read, I'm not going to go through step by step each of these. Um, if you have any specific questions that I'm, you know, not touching upon when I go through each of these, please feel free to speak up. But again, we've tried to put, you know, the exact steps when you create the adjustment, what it needs to look like. And then again, as we mentioned before, um, where this is going to appear then on that, on the employee's W-2. So dependent care will be in box 10. Okay. When it comes to third-party sick pay, um, again, we have a document that's specific to um, third-party sick pay, and the key is whether it's taxable or not. So if it's not taxable, we've outlined the steps here, um, creating an adjustment, choosing third-party pay as the type, um, what needs to happen you know, um, for that to appear then in box 12 with the code J. Um, or if it's taxable, what steps need to happen um, in order for um, it to get 
process correctly. Okay. Again, I'm not going to step through. We've put, you know, all of the details in the actual checklist itself. Um, so hopefully following along, you know, with each of these specific check checklists will be super helpful. Okay. I did want to point out that on our um, Just open another session here quick, sorry. We do have an example. Um, if somebody's not familiar with what the third party notices look like um, when it comes to you know what the districts receive, this is just an example of what that, that could look like. Um, you know, and then whether um, taxes were withheld or not. Again, this is just a sample. Every you know third party, their form is going to look a little different, but this gives you, um, you know, an example of what it could look like. Okay, so again, the key to third party sick pay is whether it's taxable or non-taxable, and then based on um, you know the answer to that question, you know, follow the document, um, and again, the the non-taxable will get placed on their W-2 in box 12 with a code J, okay? Life insurance, again, we talked about this before, um, but this is saying, you know, okay, what happens now if I already processed my last pay of the calendar year and I didn't process that life insurance pay type? So again, the life insurance pay type was not used what do I need to, how do I need to fix that? How do I need to get that entered in the system so it's um, correctly reported on the W-2? Believe it or not, and some of you might already have um, uh, realized this, it's not as painful as what Classic was. Um, so we've entered steps or outlined steps here. Um, it's really just as simple as adding an adjustment um, using the life insurance premium Pay, um, type, um, and then you're going to enter that cost of life insurance, um, and then you will have to, you know, take into consideration uh, the Medicare side. So we do have a note um, up here. Um, if the Medicare withholding was paid by the employee, the employer, or a combination of the both, of both, then adjustments need to be made to the amount withheld and the board amount of the payroll item. Um, if the Medicare is fully paid by the board, they have Medicare pickup, then you'll just wanna add the adjustment for the board amount of a payroll item, okay? Um, the city, um, that's going to be um, adjusted based on whether um, that non-tax, non-cash earnings checkbox is marked or not, okay? So you wanna take that into consideration when it comes to the city side of things. Okay, step 32 um, talks about fringe benefits. So if you want, um, you know, if the district wants any fringe benefit to be reported in box 14, coded as a fringe, um, then this is the type then of adjustment they'll want to use, um, fringe benefits. Oh. Moving expenses, um, whoops, sorry, I scrolled too far. Again, um, this has hey, been Lori. in place for a yes. I'm sorry to no, interrupt. You're fine. I just wanted to ask before we move on. So, the fringe benefits um, adjustment. So, in the past, that would have added to um, federal taxable wages and state taxable wages. Does it still do that? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think okay. that that is going to be just the taxable benefit correct which yes. is like step uh, it's somewhere uh 36 yes yes correct that's absolutely okay. correct so, yeah that's the difference because last year there was fringe did that and taxable did federal state medicare like they but it was like two options like depending on the benefit but I never knew what fringe was for because 
you know, all fringe benefits are also taxable to Medicare from what I was able to tell. Yeah, so I think that's uh, a change from last year and I could find the ticket so we don't waste people's time. I just wanted to point out because I feel like that's a change that okay, fringe benefits I, aren't adding to taxable gross in any way. Yeah. And let me double check on that because I don't know that it changed, but I do know we had several questions about the difference and when you would use fringe versus, you know, what yeah. I'm going to speak. I know that was me. I know one of those okay. was me because I was yeah. like, when do you use one versus the other? Yep. And yeah. Um, yeah. And the taxable, obviously it's, it's doing what the name says. And then the fringe is not. Um, I'm okay. trying to think of an example of when you would use a fringe. Well, that's what I tried to figure out last year. And I couldn't, I felt like everything was supposed to be taxable. Mm -hmm that my districts did, you know, there's so many yeah. ways that right. this can happen Correct. though. Correct. Yeah. Let me, I'm making a note of that and let me um, okay. do some thinking on when you would use the fringe. Um, Cause again, it's just placing it in box 14. That's all it's doing. Um, Lori, would you do that for like educational assistance? would be a fringe and then you you wouldn't pay tax on education assistance that that's a that could be that's a good example oh yeah unless it's over the amount so oh, it's right. a way unless to show it amount. right Correct. right 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 I, I would I okay would that makes sense that. Brittany I would agree with that that's a great that's a great um example Okay, so that so it's like fringe benefits that aren't taxable, but you want to show the amount of the fringe. Correct. I, can we just verify that it's not adding to taxable yes. gross? Yep, I made a note okay. of it, but I'm I'm yeah, I, I will verify that. But yes, I my understanding is the fringe benefits does not do anything with the taxing side of things. But I will okay. I will definitely get clarification for that. But Perfect. yeah, the educational so expenses, that's a great example. I that's that would be that would be a use a good use for that. Okay. Um the step 33, this has changed, this changed, you know, several years ago. Um, it's only for active military employees. So I'm not sure, you know, how frequently this is used, but again, if if your district does have that situation, um, then again, you'll add an adjustment. Um, the type then will be moving expenses, and then um, the system will place that um, amount then in box 12 with a code of P. Okay. Um, lease vehicle or company vehicle. Um, we've outlined, you know, as far as what um, this type of adjustment will do. Um, it adds to the total and the applicable gross on the federal in Ohio. Um, and again, you'll add an adjustment and then you'll use the type uh, vehicle lease. And then that places that amount also in box 14. Okay. Um, when it comes to adding, um, when we talk about creating your um, W-2 print files, just keep in mind that um, leased vehicle that hasn't changed from in, in the past. If an employee has this type of adjustment, that will be the first um, uh, available option or thing that's, that's listed on that employee's W-2. So uh, leased vehicle information always has to print. So that will be the first item printed in box 14 that um, hasn't changed from years um, past. Um, adoption assistance, whoops, I scrolled too far, I'm sorry. Again, if this pay type was not used um, prior to the last pay of the calendar year, so again, you know, these are all sort of after the fact, um, then this has to be entered as an adjustment um, so that it correctly um, is reported on the employee's W-2. We uh, outline here what will happen from the tax side of things. Um, it'll automatically adjust Medicare and city um, if applicable. 
and then the total and the applicable gross. Um, so the city is only adjusted if that non, I'm sorry, tax non-cash earnings checkbox is marked on the payroll item configuration screen. Okay. So again, it steps you through how to add that type of adjustment. You use the type of adoption assistance, excuse me, and then it will place that um, amount in box 12 with a code T on the employee's W-2. Okay. Step 36, taxable benefits. And like we like we were saying before, there are so many different variables and ways, you know, districts, how districts want certain things um, to appear on um, employees' W-2s. Um, so we do have a link here to um, a reimbursable employees' expenses checklist. And it basically steps you through different scenarios. So how do they want this to appear on the W-2? Um, and how how was it already paid? So um, you, you can step through then and each option gives you a couple different um, ways to go about, ways to approach um, having that appear correctly on the employee's W-2. So again, if you know a district is questioning um, you how to make something work, you know, in the system so it appears correctly on their W-2, use this document and go through these different scenarios and see if one fits. And then again, we give you pretty specific directions on, you know, how to go about um, entering that in the system so it is correctly reported. Okay. I think there's maybe six different scenarios. Seven, I'm sorry. Um, so again, hopefully one of those scenarios fits um, your district's situation and then you can just follow these steps that we have listed here. Okay. Um, again, it talks about entering the adjustment, but this checklist here will give you more specific instructions. Um, if you use the um, non-cash taxable benefit pay type during the payroll process, then, um, you know, before the end of the year, then nothing further is needed. Employer health coverage. Um, again, this is required um, to um, be reported on the employee's um, W-2. So um, if you have, or if the district has their payroll item configuration screens um, for their health insurance already set up as being, um, you know, their health, their employer health coverage, those check boxes marked, then the system's going to do all the work for you. Okay. So what I'm talking about is if we go to payroll item configuration, and if I go down, I'm just going to open up one of these um, payroll item configurations. If this checkbox is marked and it has been checked the entire year, and if the district is um, tracking both the employee and the employer amount on um, the system, then nothing else needs to be done. The system's going to report the correct amount. Um, they're good. However, if you need to um, adjust an individual, um, maybe something you know, isn't quite right for just one or a few people, you can actually use an adjustment on the federal payroll item using the health insurance type and then post that for the amount that you want to be added to the existing amount. So we have a note here, the adjustment, um, hopefully all of you know by now, adjustments don't override anything, they're just adding to the existing. So if you needed um, this amount to be $100 and it's only showing 50, you would add the adjustment for $50. So what's already there, $50 plus my adjustment of 50 will give me the $100 that I need to be reported on um, the employee's W-2. Okay, if you need to um, update several employees, you know, rather than going one by one, you can use mass load. 
Um, I have a link here to the mass load chapter. It will provide you the um, headings that need to be um, in place um, in your uh, load sheet spreadsheet um, so that it loads properly. But once that CSV file has been created, um, you'll just use mass load um, and then select the adjustment journal as the importable entity to update all of those values. This then gets placed in box 12 with a code DD. Okay. Next is the health reimbursement arrangement. Um, I'm not sure if this applies to any districts throughout the state of Ohio, um, but um, because it's only it only applies to those who employ 50 full-time employees or less, and those that work 130 hours a month or 30 or more hours a week for 120 consecutive days. And the district does not offer any type of health insurance. So I'm not sure that this applies to any of your districts. Um, if it does, then um, you'll go, you know, again, use an adjustment to the federal payroll item using the health reimbursement type. Um, and that then will get placed in box 12 with a code of FF. Okay. All right. So that's kind of just all those special reporting situations, how to get those reported. Um, again, you know, hopefully you'll find all those checklists within the checklist, those links, um, super helpful. Um, there's a lot of detail in those step-by-step -step instructions to help, um, you know, aid in, in um, entering all of those. Are there any questions on any of those before we move forward? I am Lord. sorry, I, I'm not looking at the chat. <laughs> I, I apologize, I'm terrible at that. Lori, on the health insurance, mm -hmm. um, I know we have a bunch of, a couple of districts that want to put the full amount in. Yes. So would we do that through adjustments? Would we have to know what's in there? Yeah, so you you will. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying. We, we've had that in the past as well. Um, so you'll have to use, my suggestion would be to use mass load. You're not going to want to go into, I'm assuming it's, you know, more than just a handful of people. No, um, it's the whole district. Yeah, I would, you know, use mass load to create a spreadsheet. And it might be easy, it might be helpful if it's as easy as grouping the the amounts um, that are currently being reported together on your spreadsheet. And then you can mass change those amounts um, based on that current value. Um, just keep in mind what's already there you know, you need to, the adjustment needs to be for the difference. So again, you know, if it's, if it's currently reporting $50 and the district wants it to be 100, the adjustment is only going to be for $50, but you might be able to, when you pull the spreadsheet, group the, the amounts together, and then that will allow you to mass, you know, update the spreadsheet the adjustments by those groups of people. Am I making sense? And yeah, so there's no override like there has been in the past. No, there's no override. You you will have to use mass load to load the adjustment. And the adjustment is the difference, mm -hmm. not yeah, you know, not that it doesn't override the existing amount. You want to add the adjustment for a positive or negative to make it what you need it to be. Okay, because I can think three of my biggest districts do that. Okay, and if you need help, Brenda, with getting the spreadsheet or getting one started, just reach out, and okay. we'll, uh, we'll help you. We'll help you get um, something extracted from like the payroll item, um, those health insurance payroll item screens, and then um, you know, I think if you 
I think if we group the rates, the amounts together, I would think like maybe, maybe you might have single family. I don't know if there's a couple plans offered, but you might be able to group those rate, those amounts together and then know that, oh, this group of people, the adjustment needs to be $50. This group of people, the adjustment needs to be 75. We're going to get rid of everything on the spreadsheet that doesn't need to be there and load those adjustments. Okay. Okay. But if you need yeah. help getting started with one, um, reach out and we'll, we'll be glad to help you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so it looks like in the chat, I was just check, kind of trying to catch up, I'm sorry. Okay, so Marsha's gonna help Tanya. Okay, and yes, that is a very important um, question. Um, the question was uh, regarding the HF, HSA, if the board contributes on the USAS, and that's processed on the USAS side, does that need to be loaded on the payroll side um, in order for that to appear on the W-2? The answer is yes. And unfortunately, Moveka um, did, we had, you know, to help them through a situation last year to get those amounts reported correctly. So Tanya, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out, but it looks like Marsha is going to help you as well. So I'm um, sorry I didn't see that sooner. We're happy to help if you need if you need our assistance as well. Okay. Um, w two report and submission I think is where we were at. So we're gonna um, lastly step through the process of generating the reports, and then the submission files. So we do have a link here. Um, to the W-2 report and submission chapter. Um, so hopefully if you have any questions, you know, regarding specific um, specifics um, on, on different options, we do have, um, I have the link there for you and I'll take you right to the chapter and then you can, you know, go to that particular part in the chapter um, for, some assistance um, if you're not sure on what a field means or or um, so forth that that should be helpful. The first thing that you'll want your districts to do is um, run the air report. So if you go to W2 report and submission, we're going to stick with this W2 report options tab. There's an option that says, um, sorry, I'm not on report. I'm like that doesn't look right. So you wanna make sure that the um, report option is selected. And then you're gonna check the box that says report employees with errors only. So this is probably the first thing that districts are gonna to wanna, to, going to want to check. Um, you might have informational errors, like, you know, uh, OSDI checking, those sorts of things where, um, they didn't make enough money uh, or have enough in earnings. Um, some of those um, errors can be ignored. Others, you know, we need to pay attention to and fix. So in the documentation at the very bottom of the chapter um, is, are the error and warnings. So if you have, you know, specific questions regarding um, those errors and warnings, um, you can, you know, refer to that um, section in the documentation and that will hopefully point you in the right direction or get you started um, at you know where to where to look to fix that. Obviously if you have questions that you know you can't answer, we're here to help. So just reach out. So you're gonna they'll run the 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 report um, selecting you know to report employees with errors only. I think you know we have this bolded here because um, it, it is not checked by default. So, you know, it is important that they run this report first for just the errors, verify those errors, um, you know, make sure everything's okay. Then they're going to run the report again 
and uncheck that box. So we'll uncheck that report um, employee with errors. And this is going to give them a report you know, of everything. So they can run this report as many times as necessary until they feel that all of their information is accurate. Um, we do have a, a, an additional supporting document called the effects of special W-2 processing. Um, I'm sorry, W-2 situations on processing that might be helpful um, with how certain um, the uh, certain uh, adjustments, those sorts of things, how the system is handling those. Okay. So that will help then in those um, balancing situations. If they have questions, you're going to know specifically how the system's treating those, um, each of those types. Once um, the district has run this, and again, they're probably running this multiple, multiple times, double and triple checking everything. Um, now they're going to be ready to create their print file. Okay. So we now have the ability in this software for districts to create a print file and print their own W-2s. Okay. So the, the checklist, we've tried to break it out um, you know, in, in sections so that if the ITC is still printing the W-2s um, on their behalf, then you'll want to you know, pay particular attention to the spot that says if your ITC is printing your W-2s. Um, if the district is printing their own W-2s, we've added a new option called W-2 printing. So they would go to this tab. They would then verify, you know, we have this spelled out on the checklist. Can't emphasize enough, you know, to them to make sure that all of this information is correct. There's a sort option. So how they want their print file to be sorted. Make sure this says 2022, which it should default based on the um, current year. And then um, if they want to include any fringe benefits, so in box 14, um, if they want those to be printed on their W-2s, they need to then add those specific payroll item configurations. So they would begin adding those in the box below. Um, and we have a note here that says, you know, the maximum of three will print. Um, and you know, if there's nothing added in this area, then nothing will print in, um, you know, the, nothing specific will print in that box 14. Um, you know, if you're printing, if you're creating a print file for all of your employees, then you're gonna wanna leave, you know, the pay group and specific employee option blank. Down here at the very bottom is um, the generate mailable forms option. So once I click this, that's going to give me then an output file. And let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. Okay, can everybody see that okay? So here's then the four up print file um, that's generated using that new W2 printing option. Okay. Lori, does this file go into the file archives so it that uh, we as ITC could pull out how they created their print file and we print it on their behalf, but we want them to create the print file? Great question. So you want to be careful um, because, you know, if you're still using Edge, you probably want to still use the XML option. Okay. Because um, what I saw, and I, I, I plan to, you know, we plan to talk to the developers, is, you know, usually you're probably maybe running three copies per district. One's going to be your employee forms, right? You're, you're maybe printing those um, based on how the user entered 
what sort option they selected when they generated the print file. Um, some districts like to, you know, they mail them so they don't care. Some dis distribute them so they want them maybe by, you know, building and alphabetical, um, those sorts of things. Um, then the next copy is the employer copy. And that is probably just sorted alphabetical. And then the final copy is um, for your cities. And those you probably sort lo by locality, you know, if you're using um, Edge. I didn't see an option to print um, by locality. So there's not um, an option here. So we did plan to talk to the, de to the developers about that. Um, because that's going to be, I think, you know, you're not going to probably want to go through a stack of forms to pull out, you know, the, the individual cities um, that you need to send. But again, um, you know, we don't know who's getting rid of EDGE, who's going to continue with EDGE, who's going to um, allow their districts to print their own you know, W-2 information and who's going to still continue printing. So we kind of have, you know, different variables and options um, for you. But yes, Mary, your question, and I do have that. Um, let me find it quick. In the checklist, <clears throat> each step talks about where, um, to go to the file archive and make sure that those files are out there and what the names of those files would be. Um, they are gonna be different based on if the district is submitting their own, if that checkbox on the W2 configuration box is marked or not, um, the, the names of the files are slightly different. So we've noted those, you know, saying those, those names of the files are for those that are creating and submitting their own versus those that you know, are still, the ITC, ITC is still, you know, submitting on their behalf. Okay, does that kind of help answer your question? No? <laughs> okay, we'll continue on if, if, feel free to, if I didn't make that clear, or if you have any other questions, feel free to um, speak up at any time. Hey, Laura, okay. This is Andrew with Woco. Can yes. You hear me? Yes. I have another question. I'm sure. sorry. Um, no, you're what, fine. What, if we have them print their own W-2s, I know when we use Edge, uh, part of that process is creating the PDFs that end up in the kiosk. Yes. So, so <clears throat> would we still need Edge to do that right now? Um. So the developers are working on um, a process to make that happen. So you would not need edge. It's not available right now, Andrew, but it will be. Um, so that is something that um, there's a few outstanding W2 type issues um, that the developers are still working on. And one of them is exactly what you just asked. So great question. It is in the works. Um, it will be available. So if you are not a district or an ITC that wants to use EDGE, um, you won't have to. Okay, and can okay. you verify what kind of forms, is it the same forms as last year that will be supported like for printing? It is. The, okay. the four up you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, because we ordered forms not knowing that this is going to be a possibility, but we are interested in at least having some of our districts do this. So yeah. it's the exact same form. It's the four up forms. Yes, them. yes, okay. correct. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. So I think we got through um, the printing side of things. Um, so we talked about, you know, if the district is going to print um, their own 
W-2s or um, if and you know you at the ITC are not going to use Edge any longer, you do have the capabilities to do that within the software. Um, if you're an ITC and you are going to print your um, employees or your district's W-2s and you're still using Edge, then that process is just slightly different. It hasn't changed from years past, um, but you'll want to um, use the XML option just like you always have. So under the W-2 reports option, you would select XML. The district would select XML, I'm sorry. And then you would generate your, your XML output file. So this is the option then that you would use, the district would use to generate their um, print file for you um, if you're still running it through Edge. Okay, um, just a note here, I know that this has come up um, before and just to kind of eliminate any confusion, unless, unless Edge has changed the software, which very well could be, um, you know, we've always encouraged the employer, I'm sorry, the employee copies, you know, the, the program in redesign to be run based on selecting the sort option that um, matches how they want their employee copies. Um, unless something's changed in Edge, you, you don't have a way, you know, it's not, there's no way to sort it by like building department is, if that's what they're wanting, um, how they want their employee copies to be sorted. So if you, you know, advise them to sort those employee copies, um, I'm sorry, select the sort option when they're generating the XML file, based on how they want the employee copies to be sorted, then, you know, most generally they want um, the employer copies sorted by in alphabetical, which that's an option in Edge, and then um, the city copies to be sorted by locality, and that's also an option in Edge. So just, you know, unless something's changed, I'm not, you know, up to speed on Edge's software per se, but um, the sort option, you know, maybe advise them to select how they want their employee copies sorted. Um, and then, you know, the other two copies you're able to manipulate um, based on those, the, the software, the sort, the sort options the software already provides. Okay. So once you have your XML file created, then, um, You'll obviously, you know, want that to be saved to your desktop somewhere. Um, again, as was asked before, that XML file is saved in the file archive. Um, and then um, you, you know, at the ITC have your own instructions on how you want the districts to send that file to you securely. So, you know, however you, whatever means you have to get that file from them. Um, you know, that's each, just each ITC is probably different. Okay, so that's printing. Um, when it comes to creating submission files, um, you know, first we'll talk about the federal submission file. Again, we're going to go um, to the W-2 report option. You'll click on submission. Again, verify that all of this information that's populated um, is correct. Generate the submission file summary report. Verify that, make sure everything looks good. If everything's good, um, you're ready to then create your W-2 submission file. We have steps here um, based on how um, you know the Social Security Administration, in particular, the Business Services Online, would like the file um, uh, uploaded or, or formatted, I should say, um, and that's to compress the file. So we have a step here that once you have that file created, um, you're going to right-click on that, and then you're going to send that to a compressed zip folder. And that just helps, you know, reduce the size and make sure that, you know, you're not trying to submit something on your computer that's 
um, past the limit. Again, um, the as mentioned before, um, we do just, you know, just encourage your districts to go out and double check the file archive and make sure that something fluky didn't happen with their calendar year and bundle. Um, you know, at this point when they create the file for federal, um, if they go out to that 2022 calendar year end reports um, folder, they just single click on it. You should see then these, these um, files and reports listed. Um, again, if they're, um, if they have that box on the configuration screen checked and they're submitting their own, then they will have the W2 mast .txt file. If they're not, if they don't have that option checked, then they're gonna have a W2 tape .txt file listed. And we've kind of outlined that here. Um, so it could be named either one of these um, based on how that configuration screen is set up. Okay, so if your district, if if you are still having your districts, then you know send that file to you, and you're going to send that on their behalf. Then you know you have again means to get that to you securely, um, and we're going to cover the IT management, ITC management portion, like we talked about at the beginning of of the session. We'll cover that in December. Okay. Um, you, we do encourage you to run the uh, file through AccuAge. So we have steps to do that here. Um, that's gonna you know, check for any errors, um, kind of alert you to anything that might be needing to be fixed ahead of time. Um, and then you can log, the districts then um, would log into the BSO and upload their file. And we have the steps then um, you follow once you're on that website. Okay, um, that when it comes to the Ohio submission file, basically, you know, it's it's very similar to the state file. Um, under the W two state options tab, um, we're gonna we would select then the Ohio, and based on <clears throat> all the information, just double check that again. It should be populating for you. Again, anytime there's a file summary report, we do advise that you generate that first, and then you're gonna generate <clears throat> the Ohio submission file. Again, based on if you at the ITC um, is submitting that on your district's behalf, or if they're submitting their own, um, is gonna you know, provide uh, different naming conventions for the file. Um, You'll again want to zip that file by right clicking on the file. Make sure that those files are out in the file archive. And then follow the instructions. You know, the districts would follow the instructions to get that file to you. Or um, if they're submitting it on their behalf, they're going to upload that up file then to the Ohio Business Gateway. Okay. We do, you know, advise you to run. Um, or districts to run that file through AccuAge um, again, um, just to double check and make sure there's no errors. Those can be cleaned up before you even um, get to the uploading part. Okay, when it comes to the state, um, other state submissions, I'm sorry, um, we the, the software does support Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Um, I did try to go out to um, each of these websites and make sure that the filing requirements didn't change. The only one um, that that changed <clears throat> from what I can see is Kentucky now only accepts electronic filing. I couldn't find anything that specifically said that um, on P Pennsylvania's. Um, so it, it just talked about electronic filing. So I'm thinking that they maybe um, switching to the same thing. They are also switching to a new system. Um, it was like e-tides and now at the, it said sometime in the month of November, it's switching to, I think it's called like paths or e-paths. I wrote it, my path, that's what it was. Um, so it was kind of difficult to, you know, read exactly how that, 
their their filing requirements um, based on them switching systems. So, you know, if you do have districts that um, withhold for Pennsylvania, um, you might want to keep an eye on that um, website, and we have that link again on um, our main um, calendar year end page, and see if once it does switch, if they give more specific um, direction. <clears throat> Okay, so Indiana is a little different. Um, they have a county tax. So um, it is, you know, you do have to have that payroll item configuration city record set up for that county tax. And I do have a snippet that we have that kind of outlines how that payroll item configuration screen should look. Um, so there, the two requirements are that the tax entity code is provided and the payee address has to have the, um, the state has to be Indi Indiana. So those are the two requirements when it comes to setting up this county tax. And I'm assuming that, you know, if your districts are withholding for the state of Indiana, you know, they're familiar with this county tax, it would just be for you know, any district that's going to start withholding that going forward. There's a link here um, specifically to that Indiana um, county tax that references, you know, uh, it's a reference to that and it's going to give further guidance on how that needs to be set up. But again, um, I think we're running a little short on time, but you're basically going to be um, creating those state submission taxes, tax files um, separately. So if your district has, you know, the state of Kentucky, um, again, you're going to select that under the W-2 state options, select Kentucky, generate the file summary report, and then generate the submission file. And really the screens are going to look the same um, except for Indiana. And you can see that that's then, um, you know, the taxpayer ID and the TID location, those, those two fields get added because that um, submission file is slightly different. Okay. So once those, you know, if any of those state files apply, um, then we've named those um, below what the names of those, each of those would be. Again, go out and make sure that those got copied out to the file archive. Um, again, those names are going to look slightly different based on whether the district is creating those files uh, and submitting those files themselves versus that box on the configuration screen not being checked. They would then get those files um, to you if you're still submitting those on their behalf or they would upload those um, to the appropriate state website. When it comes to the city files, um, again, there's a W2 city option. Make sure the information looks correct. You would make sure that you enter the tax entity code um, based on how that payroll item configuration screen is set up. And you would have to run this then for each entity or each city individually. So if, you know, a district has, you know, three cities that they're reporting to, um, then each of these would have their own entity code. You would enter that, each of those here, generate the file submission summary report, and then the submission file. Those then also get copied out to the file archive. So you're gonna see you know, each of those cities listed separately. And then the district would upload that to the appropriate city um, website, or if you're submitting that on their behalf, they would again, get that file to you securely. The CCA um, and Rita, I'm gonna kind of lump these together for, um, to save some time here. If you go to W2 report and you click on submission, 
There's options at the bottom. So I think this was asked earlier. Um, again, there's a CCA option and there's a RITA option. So again, generate your summary report for CCA first and then generate the submission file. And then likewise, you can do the same for RITA. So that's where you'll go then when that question was asked earlier about are, is there a submission file that's generated by the system? Absolutely there is. Okay. Are there any questions when it comes to generating the submission files? I know we are very, very late on past our time. Okay, then a couple just follow up kind of things. Um, we did add a brand new option, a report option called the year to date report, which for those of you um, familiar with classics year to date report, um, this is um, now available in the redesign. It's brand new. Um, so if you go to reports, there's an option called year to YTD report, and this allows you to um, generate um, kind of a summary of employees' um, compensation amounts, their um, benefit, uh, their benefit balances, and those sorts of things. So you want to make sure probably that the include um, compensation information on report checkbox is marked. Um, if you want to include archived employees, you have that option as well. If you want to run the report for specific employees or specific pay groups, you have that ability. Maybe somebody loses theirs, you need to print out a new copy, you can do that. And by default, then the job statuses that are selected are active and inactive. Okay. Once you generate that report, then um, I have a copy of what it looks like. Make it a little bigger here for you. So here's then what that looks like it has your benefit balances, contract information, um, and your and payroll item information. Okay, I know we've been asked about this for a long time, so hopefully um, people will like it and, um, you know, I, I know a lot of districts print these and then they distribute them um, to their employees at the end of um, the year, like you know, along with their W-2s if they're not mailing them or might put them in mailboxes for their employees to have um, for their, you know, tax purposes and those sorts of things. Okay, so that's brand new and that's available. Um, lastly then, um, once you um, are truly done with W-2 processing, um, you want to make sure that your districts go in and they actually close the December posting period, okay? So you're gonna to go to core, posting period, click on the um, file folder, and then under the um, open column, that field should say false. So you just wanna make sure that that gets closed. That triggers a whole um, series of reports then to be copied out to the file archive under the calendar year end um, report bundle. And those reports are listed here. So the attendance journal, the leave balance, the payment transaction status, employee master, and earnings register. So in addition to your print files, your submission files, you will also have these reports all in that um, calendar you're in bundle. Okay. All right. I apologize. We went like a half an hour over um, what we were supposed to. Just want to quickly look at my notes and make sure I haven't missed anything. Okay, a couple of things I wanted to mention, um, and we already talked about one of them, um, a couple outstanding W-2 issues that will be available um, before the end of the calendar year. One is um, generating the PDFs for the kiosk, so that that's still yet to come. Um, when you click on the printing um, of your W-2 file. So if I go back to W-2 report and submission, and I go to the W-2 printing um, tab, when you generate the mailable forms for larger districts, this is going to take a little bit of time. Currently, this just runs in real time. So if I click this, it's it's gonna generate and it's, it's out there, um, you know, generating as we speak. 
Um, in the near future, we're going to be able to run that and, and have that generating in the background. So they're going to, they will, the developers, developers are working on generating that, um, you know, in the background so it doesn't hold districts up from processing. So that will be a change. So don't panic if you're, you know, out there um, looking at things um, that will be um, changed as well. And then I think that was it. Those were the two that I wanted to mention. Um, just so you know that those are coming in the works. Um, does anybody have any questions? I feel like we flew through the last part pretty quickly, but I welcome any questions. Rhonda or Lori, it looks like Rhonda had a question and it's a good one. So it says um, the district should not change the current period until the calendar year in bundle completes. Is that similar to kind of how USAS runs yeah. where you want to wait and then, you know, review the job scheduler? And then once that completes, you would close. So in order for these reports to be generated, you have to close December. So this is what triggers that these reports to be generated. So they're not going to be out there until you close December. Does that help? But I think the question is more, you should not make January current until after the um, calendar year end report bundle completes. Okay. So districts, if they have to process their first pay in January, they will have to make this or January current. And that's the, kind of the flexibility in the software, you know, they can keep going and then come back and work at on their W-2s. When they go back and work on their W-2s, then do they make December current again? And then December is current when they, because what happens in accounting, if you have the next month open. If you make the next month current before the report bundle completes, it has all of the headings as the next month rather than the month that they're actually closing. So that's the question. If they have January current and they run the calendar year end report bundle, is it going to show headings of calendar year 23? month January rather than December and calendar year 22. Yeah, I, and that's a good point. I do think it does, Mary, that it doesn't, it works the same as USAS. Uh, the figures and the information are obviously not as of January, it's December, but the right. headings at the top, um, I think that's what they call like something in common where it, you know, it's on both payroll and USAS. And once we change one, then the update will apply to both applications or both sides. Um, but in order to, in order for those calendar year and reports to generate, December has to be closed. Um, right. I, I don't, right. Or you have to make December current. Yeah, you can make December current. I just, okay. I hesitate making, you know, things current and then closing them. Um, that, I guess that's up to you guys, but, um, and I, I do know that the auditors don't like that. I, I, I understand. And I, I'm not sure I'd have to look at when, I know that's definitely a, a JIRA issue um, on both sides. Um, and I don't know when that's going, when that is expected to be released. Um, and I can definitely check on that. Um, but so Lori, if a district has made, has created January, made January current, mm -hmm. and then they go and do their W-2s and then close December mm -hmm. without changing what's current, they'll still get the correct reports yes. for, de for yes. the year yes. without having to go. That is absolutely correct. Closing okay. December fires all of those reports and it will be the correct information but as mentioned before the top of the report is going to say January 2023 because that's the current 
posting period. And, and, you know, we are aware of that and that will be changed at some point. I'm just not sure when I could check on that. Um, but that you are absolutely correct. That will closing December fires those reports with the correct, you know, calendar year 22 information. The heading of the report will not say December, it will say January. But there shouldn't be a problem, if, even if they've already made January current, going back since December is open, making it current and then closing it before they make January current again. No, they just have to be careful that they okay. remember to go back. Yeah. Um, um, I have one more question. That would be my concern. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. Um, and I apologize if you already answered this, uh, but uh, we chose not to do EDGE this year. Mm -hmm. We're going to use the PDF print file that is generated and uh, to print the forms. And okay. we are going to print the forms on behalf of the districts. Okay. Is there an option to create a, um, like the employer copy through EDGE created a um, um, half sheet, um, one copy per person, um, is that option available within the system to create the um, uh, half sheet, eight and a half by 11, um, one yes. copy per person? Yes. So, because I asked Mark this question, because I knew, and I apologize, apologize that I didn't mention it earlier. Um, Yes, they are going to have, they're going to update so that you have the eight and a half by 11. Let me make sure. I know that the city, um, the city printing them by locality is what we, I was going to discuss with the developers because I don't see a way to make that happen currently. Um, but they are going to have, um, you will have a way to print on um, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. Yes, yes, you will. I had to read through and make sure that I wasn't mistaken. Um, they will, you will have an eight and a half and 11 option and then the eight and a half by 14 the folder sealer option. Those, those currently are gonna be the only two options available. The city, printing the cities by locality, I think we still have to look into and find out how that's gonna work. Okay, that okay. that is extremely helpful. Thank you so okay. much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I don't think I see anything in the chat here. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody's questions. If I did, please feel free to send me a message. Um, I don't mean to intentionally overlook something. It's just sometimes hard to keep an eye on both of them. All right. I thank everybody for their time. I am so sorry that it went way over what I was supposed to. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful you know, holiday season. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking to everybody soon. Um, Amanda, do you want to take like a 10 minute, five minute break? What, what do we think? And then, yeah, let's do a we'll break and then let's start back up with USAS at like 11. Okay. That sounds great. We'll meet back at 11. Thank you everybody so much. We are back. I'm going to um, go ahead and get going on the USAS portion of the calendar year end closing procedures. Um, so uh, I probably, I know we had kind of on the agenda looked at 1130. Um, I want to make sure we talk about everything. So we might go, um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe till noonish, but, you know, we'll try and, and, and move um, as quickly as you can. However, we are definitely recording this. So if anybody has to, you know, go, I understand. Um, and we will be posting the recording out there. So let's go to, oops. Um, let's go, I'm going back to 
our calendar year on meeting page where uh, Lori had brought us earlier um, where we're looking at, you know, here's the agenda, the recorded webinar, we will be putting that um, direct link right on this page so that you can easily access that later. Um, and then this section over on the left here is where we have the USAS calendar yarn materials. So um, we have a couple of things. I have uh, the presentation that we're gonna kind of um, step through and look at that on the USAS side. There is a calendar um, urine checklist and um, that is available. This is kind of um, on the USAS side, it's kind of some general procedures. So we are going to be talking through uh, some of these different steps here. This is kind of a standard checklist. Um, as we talk through this presentation, we'll see that there are things where like, um, you know, you may choose to do something this way, you may choose to do something that way, especially when it comes to printing and submitting, just like we talked about with USPS. Um, and so these are kind of the standard procedures, but at the ITC, you can definitely um, kind of take this and customize it um, to what, what fits for you and your districts. Um, and then all of these other ones here, um, I will be referencing um, also in um, throughout the presentation. And um, these, a lot of these, so we, we kind of formatted this page where you can see the source. And I have a lot of these that are directly IRS links. So these are kind of supporting documentation. They're not things that we write at SSBT, but it's an easy way for you to be able to get to the links that you need from the IRS site. Okay. All right. So um, to start, uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to hop back over to my presentation here. And we'll kind of hop in and out. We will look at some stuff in the software as well. Um, but kind of our general layout of what we're going to talk about today is things that are more so pre-closing procedures, uh, things that you can start doing now, start thinking about now in order to prepare for um, calendar year end. And then we have kind of the standard like month and calendar year and close procedures. Um, and last, we'll get a little bit more specific on the 1099 NEC and miscellaneous procedures when it comes to the submission files and um, printing those and what the options are there. Also, um, before we get too far in here, um, you know, same thing goes, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to unmute and ask those. Um, I do have the chat open as well. So um, however, you know, wh whatever works for you, um, please feel free if there are questions along the way to let me know. Okay, so we're in the preliminary steps to start. And the very first thing that um, I have on this slide is um, a reference to publication 1220. And this is one of the IRS links in there. It's basically a guide to like electronic submitting. Um, because with those 1099 files, so there's going to be the submission to the IRS saying these are the 1099 that the, that the district had that they issued. And then there's the second part, which is printing and providing those to the vendors. So, um, so this is, first of all, this is the part of electronic submission. Um, Publication 1220 is a really good reference. Um, so we do recommend, you know, review that, be informed. If um, there are certain things that um, come up like uh, correction questions or things like that, um, this publication has a lot of really good information regarding those things. It's formatted very well um, with a table of contents, helps you kind of find what you need. So, so the first thing, you know, if I would say, you know, pull a copy of this and make sure that's available um, to you in your districts. This section that's included here is what's new for tax year 2022. Um, a couple things on here that um, mainly the notable one um, is the step two and three. They mention that um, they're transitioning to new information returns TCC. So that TCC is the transmitter control code. And that's something, um, we have another slide on this as well, but basically um, you like, it's, a, it's like per individual, if you are going to be submitting these files to the IRS through their, um, it's called the FIRE system, 
And um, so that's where you're going to like log in and actually upload the file. Um, beforehand, you would sign up and you would get an individual code that it kind of works with like your username um, to them in their system. It verifies who you are. Um, so uh, what they're saying here is that if you received your code prior to September 2021, so if you had an existing one before, and if, so if you're still submitting at the ITC, this might apply to you, um, then you do have to, um, there's like a new form to apply for one. Um, now, he, don't, don't panic too much though, because in this next paragraph, it does say that the application can be done anytime between September of this year and August of next year. And your current code will remain active until August 1st of next year. So based on this, my understanding is that if you had one before, you can still use it this year, but you'd need to look into um, applying again if you're going to be continuing to, to submit it. Um, and um, so I think they have you go through like a new form and a new code. Um, so, so that's that. So that's kind of the what's new recap. Um, I did also review out there, there's some instructions related to 1099s, and um, uh, there's a link here so you can go review yourself. Um, based on my review of this page, the uh, filing dates uh, are listed here. So, it, you know, when you're looking through, they have a whole chart, and it depends on the type and the situation. Um, so, and, and obviously, like, your districts are probably submitting some NECs and some miscellaneous, which those two have different dates. Um, so NEC on paper or electronically would need to be, the file would need to be submitted by January 31st. And then the um, printed forms that are provided to the vendors, also January 31st. Miscellaneous have a later date as far as the electronic filing, um, but it looks like those would also should also be sent by January 31st. So my recommendation is I would just say, hey, let's get everything done by January 31st. Um, I think that is the earliest date that I saw. Um, again, don't you probably want to look at that yourself. Um, you know, I, I don't believe there was any earlier dates than that, but um that would be my like just to be safe. <laughs> um do it. But uh so there's the link there. Um again, that one is also on the reference page um with the calendar year end information okay and so then we have a couple of slides here um kind of the same in the same idea but this is like if you are going to have your districts submit the files to the irs so if they want to log in and um i believe i have a link somewhere for this uh fire fire website so we'll, we'll take a look at that um at some point but um, if they want to, so this is, they're going to have the tape file, they're going to have the file with all of the 1099 information for the 1099s they'll be issuing. They need to submit that to the IRS website. Um, what they would need to do first is they must file with the IRS to receive their own transmitter control code um, that they need to complete this process. So here's a link to the application. Here's some more information on that as well. And that Lisa? is something, yes. Sorry, is it even possible for ITCs to send this anymore? Um, yeah, you can still send, you can still send the, um, still send like their submission file. So, um, and we'll talk about, I have some slides on that at the end. Um, and, and this is also going to go to that ITC uh, management application. So you can um, you can still download their tape files um, just like you used to, and then um, basically once we have the um, management program, you'll load all of the districts 1099 files in there, and you'll output one big file with all of the districts information together, and then log in. And so at the ITC, you could have your um, your TCC reviews for that. Thank you. No problem. So many okay. All right. So then, um, so this setup, which I mean, I did, I was taking notes. I was looking earlier when you all, all were talking about the printing and who's going to do the printing. Um, and so when it comes to like printing the files or submitting the files, 
Um, this setup is going to be for, um, so as far as like submissions, so in the configuration, so system configuration, and then it's called IRS form 1099 um, submission configuration. This information right here, transmitter control code, and then um, the contact name and phone number. So if you check this box right here that the district will submit, it's going to be um, having the code, the contact name and stuff for the district is going to change how the 1099 extract page looks so that they can generate their own submission file. Um, so the, and I believe this is specifically for uh, submitting. Let me see if they are printing, then yeah, the contact information is not included when they're printing. So say like, um, you so if you at the ITC are going to be submitting the file, but then like they might be printing, um, if, if it's a situation like that, then like you wouldn't need to check this if the ITC is still submitting the file because this information will will get on that file submission when um, you use the ITC management program that's going to include that information, um, but printing the file that print file is going to end up being the same because you're pretty much just pulling the, uh, you know, the district information, the, um, the vendor information, etc. So, okay. So then I have a couple slides here about creating a test file. And again, this is something where there are reference, um, reference links here. And, you know, mostly like we're wanting for this in here because I want to give you guys a heads up on this, but as far as like, the IRS, what their requirements are, what their dates are. Um, if they change anything, like you want to be looking at their website just so that it's not like if I put something in my presentation now and then they change it, then um, you know I don't want to run into to any potential issues. But I want to make sure that you have the um, the places to go because there's a lot a lot of places to go. <laughs> um, so from my review of this, so um, this page where it says more information on test files and the combined federal state reporting. So what I'm seeing is that first time electronic filers, um, if they're not doing co combined uh, federal and state, then I don't believe they have to do this, but I think that they probably are. So um, they're required to submit a test file before the very first submission for combined federal state um, reporting program, and then they would receive approval before um, submitting the actual file. Uh, there are some dates as far as availability for when this would happen. So let me click this. And so it, it has like some downtime schedule for updates. So here are those dates. Here's the availability. Um, so you want to review that as far as submitting test files. I want to go back here. And um, sorry. So if they are doing this at the district and they need to cr create a test file, then, um, well, actually, so I, got, I guess I kind of did these slides in um, the thought of the district doing it, but you know, you would still need a test file. Well, I take that back. So the reason this is in um, context of the district is because this is gonna be just for their information. So this would actually be when um, they are submitting. Sorry, there are so many scenarios <laughs> with this new way. <laughs> I'm trying not to confuse myself. So yeah, so if the district's gonna submit and they need the test file, they would be able to come into their 1099 extract page and then they would have this test submission type. Let's, let's go into the software and look at this so that we're not just looking at slides. So um, system configuration, I wanna first just look at this configuration we talked about. So IRS form 1099 submission configuration. If I check this box um, on, this means it's going to show the district their options um, for um, creating the submission files. And when I come into 1099 extracts, that is right here, submission type, pass. So, um, and then they would um, come through, you know, check which, which boxes, the IRS format. Um, and we will look more at this page in, in a bit, but specifically for this preliminary step, um, submission type test. 
Um, if you are submitting at the ITC and you need to get a test file, that's where um, when we do talk about the ITC uh, management. So that's where um, I think Lori had mentioned, um, you know, getting the documentation out there so that at the ITC you can work on getting test files um, if you need them or if you want them from that um, application to be able to then submit um, in advance for a test. Um, so, and then I have a note here. So with this 1099 extract uh, page in general, this page right here, so the payment year, you have your different drop dropdowns. Um, the payment year doesn't actually show in this list until December is created. So if you come in here and you're like, wait a second, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do this? Because you're doing something ahead of time. Um, then December may need to be um, created in the posting periods. It can be created and then closed. So like it's not going to be sitting out there open, um, but it just has to exist. Okay. So now we're going to kind of switch gears um, and get into the preliminary things that are actually within USAF, within the data that um, they can start to verify in order to, pr to prepare, you know, the actual information that's going to be contained um, on those forms. And uh, let me just double check my notes, make sure we're in the right spot here, cover everything. Okay. So, um, so for this, so the things that they're going to want to check in general, um, the vendors, the tax ID type, so if it's a social security number or an EIN, um, now that we're in redesign and have been in redesign for some districts for some time, um, so tax ID type was something that was kind of added, I don't know, a couple years ago, it's been a while now, but it didn't always exist. And um, what that text ID type is, it tells the printing software if it needs to format it as a social security number where it has the two dashes or an EIN with one dash. Um, when that was added, it was added in the classic software where you had to go into, like you couldn't do it through your USAS web, um, if I remember correctly. So, so basically with, with this being added, vendors that had received 1099s had this updated in the past and they'd be fine. But if there's a vendor that maybe didn't get paid for a long time, they were imported from classic into redesign, and then now they're qualifying for a 1099, there's a possibility that those vendors don't have this type defined. Um, now, if they created the vendor in redesign, it requires it now. So any newer vendors probably aren't going to fall into this category. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at how they can review this information on their vendors because it is possible if they're reviving vendors that were in their system from a long time ago, it is possible that they need to have this type defined, um, otherwise they'd get an error. So they can check, just double check ahead of time. Um, the vendor ID number, so that's going to be um, their, their TIN number. Um, that's their number that um, I believe would be on the W-9 form and that it just kind of, it's their ID number with IRS. Um, the vendor's type 1099 will be important to review. That's going to determine um, where the amounts would show on the 1099 um, miscellaneous or if they're going to get a 1099 NEC instead. And then um, we can also review the 1099 location. So the address uh, that's going to be put, uh, like the name and the address essentially, it's going to be put on that 1099. Okay, so let's hop over to the software here. Where's my mouse? Okay. So I'm gonna come to the core vendors page. And uh, let's take a look at, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up this first vendor here. And uh, what these fields that we're talking about, so we have the tax ID type. So let's say this is like a social. And then they have their ID, odd thing. It knows it's fake. Maybe I'm not supposed to put it. 
There we go. I'm not supposed to put in the dashes because I told it with this box, which one it was. Sorry. Um, and then here is their type 1099. So um, this is going to uh, non-employee compensation will mean that they would be on the NEC form if they have an amount that qualifies um, or any other you know, type um, that they may qualify. If they qualify as a different um, 1099 type, you choose it there. And then at the bottom here, um, this is what I want to look at is um, also the location. So let me make this a little bit bigger since I'm so zoomed in here. So when we, we look at this information, vendors can have these multiple locations defined. And um, the checkbox in this last column like decides what that specific address of the vendor is going to be used for. So um, this one, say this is my primary address, and then that would be used on the purchase order, and uh, this one is set for the 1099, but this vendor also has another address that they've given us that they said, please issue the check to this, um, to this name and address. So this is going to be important once we're kind of in the next step reviewing the information as far as like which address is defined as the 1099 default is based on this checkbox here. Um, okay, so let's go back here. Um, and then these slides kind of just going over what we talked about here. Um, here is, so basically in classic, you had the address and you had a separate check address. Um, and then I know in classic, there was a, like they could basically put like 1099 colon ahead of it. If that was the case, that would have come over into redesign and recognize that it's the 1099 um, address. I'm sorry, sometimes it's not advancing when I'm expecting it to, so go a little, little crazy with the, the slides here. Um, so, so basically, that's the information we want to look at. This slide gives us the options for how to review that 1099 data. And this is really where we're kind of getting into those first steps of the checklist um, because there are a couple of different ways that you can review this information. And, it, and it's the same information. It's kind of just preference on what works for the district as far as which they want to use. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is back on that vendor grid. The vendor grid, to me, I think the vendor grid is a great option because they can filter that grid, view those, um, view their 1099 vendors, and then if there's something that they need to update, they're already right in that spot and they can just go in and update that one, you know, as they're looking at it. Um, the second one is the SSDT 1099 report. This is in the report manager. They can run this at any point. December does not have to be created. So um, that's a good one to kind of run along as they go. If they prefer a report versus the grid, they could review that report information and then go to their vendor grid and update anything they need, you know, at their convenience. Um, and then the last one is this 1099 extract report. So um, we'll look at this option when we start talking about um, the steps in the checklist when we talk about um, that the more 1099 specific information uh, like the steps for submitting and generating later. This year what I would say is I would say the preliminary review to use one of these first two options. The 1099 extract report is going to be helpful and it has its place in this process but that is whenever that's that's run, it is going to send it to the report archive. So if they try and use this as their like preliminary, they might end up with a lot more copies out in the archive than they want. So that one may be best reserved for like the point in time when they're actually ready to run the 1099 extract. Um, okay, so let's go to our vendor grid and close out of this one. So again, I'm under core vendors and right on this grid, what I can do here is under my more options and, you know, I have a bunch of phone numbers on here I'm going to take off. 
Oh, we want this. Okay. So first, uh, let's see. Okay. First, let's go to um, where am I? 1099. This drop down here. So more 1099. And then I have a couple little sections I can open here. This type 1099. That's my type field that we looked at earlier. And then the ID type and the ID uh, number. So let's add all of those to our grid. We also have the section for default 1099 location. And this is where I can add um, the default 1099 address. Uh, this is where I could actually just do if I wanted like separate lines of the default 1099 location to have you know the, the name, the address, um, or I can just do the whole thing. Let's go ahead and close that so we can um, regenerate our grid. Oh, I'm sorry. We do want to add those other fields. All right, so let's do the name and line one. Let's just keep it at that. Okay. So, um, so here, what I can do now is I can go ahead and uh, filter this grid down. Um, well, oh, you know what? Let's add one more thing here. And I probably should um, just show on here. There are um, some highlights actually showing us that more option a little bit better. Let's also go to the amounts. Because there's another part of this equation, right? So we are looking at everything that is set up, we want to review these fields for the 1099 for the type, um, you know, the ID number, make sure that's in there. Um, but they do also have these year to date totals. Now, generally, they're going to be getting a 1099 if it's like um, equal to or greater than $600. Um, that's part of the, the configuration setup. Um, but if we add this year to date taxable total to our grid as well, then we can use that for filtering um, because you know the vendor could be set up for 1099 um, to get a 1099, but if they didn't actually um, have any payments issued to them this year, then they wouldn't um, qualify. So let's go, and you can see I actually have my <laughs> my it's, uh, saved my browser here. Oops, sorry, let me uh, filter the rest of this down first. So type 1099. If I do a less than or greater than sign and then non-1099, that's going to filter everything that is not equal to non-1099. So that means everything that's set as a type that would receive a 1099. Um, and then I can do this now that my grid's narrowed down a bit. And so this is going to show me the vendors that qualify um, from getting a 1099. And then what I can do from here is I can review and make sure, okay, their tax ID type, this is defined. The ID number, that's defined. Here is the address information, the name and address that those are specifically set to go to. Now, this is where, um, when I say this vendor grid, I like this option because if I see something in here and I'm like, oh, wait a second, this is not right. I could just go ahead and edit this and then um, change it you know, on the fly and save it. And then I'm still in my list so I could kind of go through. There's all of this. And so I could go through. So now I can see, okay, this one, the type has changed. And so if you have these where the tax ID type, you might come across, you know, okay, they paid like five old vendors this year. So I need to go through and um, add or change this type. I could go through and just like add those in that list right while I'm looking them up. Um, I do also have a note on this slide about this um, IRS interactive um, TIN and name matching program. So this is optional. It's something that um, is available through the IRS where you could basically um, 
enter in, or I believe they have a load in option as well, um, like the vendor ID number. So usually this probably is something you could determine by the W9, but say they have a lot of them and they want to check, they could um, use this link and then um, use that verification program um, to, to basically double check like how those, if it's a social security number and it needs to have that formatting versus the EIN with the um, different formatting. Um, I do also have a note here. So with the vendor grid, you have this option, but you do also have the ability to pull to a report right from the grid. So if they, you know, kind of want the best of both where they could just go through, they have everything that they need on this grid, but they want to have a piece of paper to go through and make their notes on um, with that same exact information, they could um, use, again, that report option right from the grid. And here's what that looks like. So it's just got all of my same columns on there. Okay. And I believe, yes, I do. Oh, and then also active true. We could have filtered with that too. I left that one off. So this is kind of preserving that sort that I'm showing in this uh, presentation. So if you need to go back and refer to this later, it is in here. So another option here, and, um, you know, I apologize, you know, my uh, test instance just has like a couple records, but, you know, districts are looking at this. I know some of them don't have very many 1099, some of them do. Um, if they wanted to go through and then look at a specific type, uh, so this is showing if you wanted to just see the royalty payments um, or just see like the attorney gross proceeds, that is another thing you could do from this grid. Uh, right here, we could, instead of this filter, oops, let me take this one out. Instead of this filter, we could come in here and um, start typing to see um, these types. Um, also an advanced query. So the advanced query could be used right on that vendor grid as well. So if they prefer like not adding all of those columns and then doing the sort of the top of the grid, this is just another way that you could go ahead and enter in those same filters and then just apply them to your grid. Um, let's see, okay. So this one again, um, oh, so this one is actually for showing the non 99 So um, I knew we were getting here eventually is, so it's good for them to look at, you know, the information related to these vendors that are set up to have 1099s. Um, but on the flip side, you know, the type 1099 is just set when they, when they add the vendor, when they, you know, if they've ever added the vendor, like that's just a field on there. So just in case a vendor got set up, but they weren't marked as 1099, then this is also an opportunity to review to see if um, any vendors maybe do need to be changed to a 1099 vendor. So let's go ahead and um, I'm going to put the active checkbox in here so they have a lot of vendors. And uh, let's um, do this filter now um, for greater than 600. So any of my vendors that got paid more than the qualifying amount within the calendar year. I'm not really sure I, with my test instance if I have vendors that qualify um, for that amount. You know what, I might not. But um, basically, let's go back to the presentation. But basically, this is saying, okay, so if they are not marked for 1099, but they have amounts that meet that threshold, oh, there we go, we can review them. And so say we find one of these and we're like, hey, you know what, this vendor, actually, they should be getting a 1099. So we can come in here, enter in their information. And then decide, okay, you know, this, they actually should be set to this 1099 type. Okay. 
and then we can go ahead um, and basically update them. So really the goal here, all of these steps, the goal here is just to have some ways for them to be able to review these vendors, make sure that the vendors who need to be getting 1099s are set to, the vendors that are not, um, not you know, do not need to receive 1099s are not in this list, and then also verify all of the information, the amount, the um, address information, the type, that's all going to be used for creating the 1099 forms, make sure that's accurate. Um, so that's really, really the goal um, with what we're doing with all of these steps. Um, again, you can use the advanced query um, instead of just those grid filters. And then we have the 1099 vendor report. So let's go here. This one that I'm talking about is under the report manager. And um, I have just a filter that I can put in my grid here just using my wildcards to, to look that up. And let's run this real quick. It's going to be based on my current period, so I'm just double checking that. My options of this report. So you do need to enter in the year-to-date taxable total greater, greater than, so you're going to enter that in there. Um, if you wanted to do it as of a certain period, or if you did want to narrow it down to a specific 1099 type, if you want to look at one type at a time, you can do that with this report. And here's what that looks like. So I have each of my um, different types. I've got a total for each type. Um, I do have the address information on here. So here's the 1099 address um, information. And then ID type, um, all of that is on there as well. Um, and then, so this is showing like you can customize that if you wanted to um, switch around um, the filters within that report, you could do that um as well okay so then this next one is talking about that 1099 extract report um so um as far as this goes this is the one that is on my periodic 1099 extract menu okay and then you know I'm debating how much I want to talk about this now because just for time purposes, we are going to look at this again when we get to the printing. So um, I know we have this in this part of our presentation, but we kind of did some adapting this year because especially with the printing options, I added a bit more at the end. So we have this here for reference. This talks about some of these fields, um, but we'll let's go through um get through our um closing steps and then i'm going to actually go back and look at these pages in some more detail now the other part of this equation um when reviewing these ahead of time um is the amounts so when we're looking at the vendor And we're looking at, so I, I added this uh, year-to-date taxable total. Now, this amount is generally made up of um, if they are a 1099 vendor and then there's a payment issue for them, then that would be added to their year-to-date totals, their year-to-date taxable totals. Um, however, if there is something that needs to be adjusted, if, there, if that amount is like incorrect um, for some reason, you do have this option right within the vendor um, for vendor adjustments. Um, and this might be like if there was multiple vendors, like I know um, we plan to have a vendor merge in the future, but for right now, this is the way around it, is um, if you need to add an amount to be included on that vendor's 1099, you would come in here, you would do create. We could give it a little description. Um, we want to make sure this taxable um, checkbox is um, set on there. And then we could um, add the amount, 
post that. And then what this is going to do, um, let's close out of here, is the taxable total is then going to reflect that. And that amount is going to be used on the 1099. Okay. And this just kind of walks through those steps. Okay, so then next we're, we're to the closing. Do you have any questions about what we've talked about so far as far as reviewing that vendor information um, um, or anything as far as the preliminary stuff? Okay, all right. Well, we'll just roll right along then. So the month end closing, um, this part is basically, you know, proceed with the closing out for the month of December. This is the same process as the regular month closes, um, you know, entering all transactions and then um, reconciling the USAS records with the bank um, and um, generate the cash summary and the financial detail report. So that's going to be reviewing the account figures, the totals on the accounts versus the actual transactions within that time period. Um, those are probably the main two right there. They may also do that with reviewing budget summary versus like budget account activity um, and that sort of thing. Any reports that they, they typically run is uh, what they still want to do um, for this process. And then the monthly report bundle, when they close the month, you know, this just has, we have it listed out, you know, what all is going to be included um, within the monthly report bundle. And then um, that will automatically run when the posting period is closed. Uh, waiting until the bundle is complete before closing another month is um, also uh, recommended. And those reports are sent to the file archive. Now it's been a couple of years since we've added this. So, you know, this information isn't necessarily anything new, um, just kind of a review of that bundle. We do have the monthly bundle, and then we're also going to talk about the calendar year bundle that gets created. Um, when it is December, there's the December reports and the things that are specific to just December do still run. And then the calendar uh, year and reports are going to be in addition to that. Um, so then as far as calendar year end closing, they want to generate any um, desired calendar year end reports that they might want. Um, the proration utility program is one that we talk about at this point in time as well. A lot of times they are looking to generate um, a spreadsheet for uh, their workers comp. So uh, this, let's take a look here. Um, I have uh, this in the software. Let's see. This is, I'm sorry, the utility is the proration utility. And what they want to do here, so they can set up a filter ahead of time. It talks about this in the presentation. Um, so that this just pulls the specific accounts that they would want for workers comp. Let's give this a little name here. And when I click create, what it's going to do it's going to pull all of the accounts that qualify in this filter. I can run it by appropriation. That was an option that we have requested along the way. So if that's something that they want to do, um, they can do that. And then what this does, so zoom out just a little bit here so we can see. What this does is it pulls all of the accounts that qualify. And um, I left this time period as calendar to date. So it's going to pull, okay, here's my, Here's my calendar date. You know what I meant to do? I um, just for my test instance, I know we don't have figures here. And that's because I need to switch my posting period. So let's do this again real quick. Sorry about that. Go to 2021 because I know I have activity there. Okay, one more time. So I have the time period, calendar to date, my account filter that I entered in there. And that account filter, I'm pretty much just pulling the accounts that have uh, an object code starting with one.
And then this just like helps us a little bit more to see is what this is pulling is it says, okay, so here's how much is um out is in this account for the calendar year so far. And it's calculating this percentage um, split off of that to say like how much would be prorated to each of those accounts based on how much has been charged to them. So if these are salaries, it's like, this is how much, how like the total of salaries has been um, paid to this account. When they get their um, workers comp amount, it's usually a lump sum. And then they want to split that out over all of the accounts that they charge salaries to. So what this is doing is it's, you know, it's saying, hey, here's an, an equal way to split this based on how many salaries were in each account, were charged to each account. So what they can do, this bar here, um, B, where I have it highlighted, I can type an amount into here. So let's do 75,000. And that's gonna load. And what that did is it said, okay, how do I wanna split out this total over all of these accounts? And based on what was originally charged to them, it figures out the fairest way, you know, it figures out the calculation of how to spread that amount over all of these accounts. Now, what I've seen with workers comp is um, I think they usually have like an amount um, and then a rate as well, like they give them some like calculation. Um, so if they do need to calculate a figure here, um, it can't, it does use like uh, Excel calculations. So say I actually need the 75,000 times 0 0.03 or whatever um, like percent um, calculation they gave them. And that'll figure the amount and then it'll spread it over um, these different accounts to um, create the charges. So this portion that we're looking at right here for the proration utility is just, okay, here's the figures, here's the calculations. I could download this to a spreadsheet if I wanted to, if they're saving it. Um, but if they did want to have these calculate and then they want to take this a step further and post these as a um, purchase order to, so that they post these amounts to their accounts and um, create the PO and then post it as a disbursement um, to actually expense these, they could use this step to create a create a POCSV, which that means it's going to um, it's going to actually create what they can import as the purchase order. So there are a couple other steps here. I know we have this in the documentation where um, let's say. They could give it a file name, account mapping, and that's something that they can set up. So like these are posting to the salary accounts, but maybe they actually want to map, you know, this, if it, if it was on this salary, if it's calculated based off of this salary account, then I want it posted to this um, corresponding benefit account. And so they can set that up in advance so that they can um, basically use this to make the posting file for the purchase order. Um, okay. And then we just have a screenshot kind of showing this example um, with, you know, where the box that you want to enter in the information. All right. So then at this point in the checklist, um, this is where, so once they are, you know, they've got every, they got all the transactions entered for the year, all of the check runs are done. So all of the vendors have been paid the amount that they're going to pay. They verified which vendors are getting 1099s and what they're getting 1099s for, um, that sort of thing. Then this is where they can come to that periodic 1099 extract page and um, they can use this to be generating their files. So let's go to 1099 extracts. So payment year is going to be 2022, which let me change my posting period back. All right. 
And then I would select, okay, so there's the type of return. I could do the NEC and the miscellaneous. Um, my output file types. Let's take a minute to talk about these. The IRS format, this is the tape file. This is what they're going to generate in order to um, submit to the IRS. through. So that's the FIRE website that we're talking about, their electronic submission file. That's this IRS format. The XML format. So if um, if the 1099s are still being printed using a third party software like Edge, um, then you would output. Um, I'm sorry. Then you would output the XML format, um, save that, and then um, that would go into that other software in order to be able to generate and print the forms. The PDF format, so this um, is, it was in here before, it's kind of just like a standard reference copy or like a preview copy. Um, this might be, you know, I know on the uh, USPS side, we were talking about like, what if they just want like, you know, a standard thing for the employer to save, this is an option. Um, we basically just left this in here since it was there before. But in addition to that, we added these reference copies. And if I click on this, you'll see I get another drop down here. And this has um, all of the different copy, like copy options that um, are kind of defined by IRS. And I have these listed in the presentation. So generally, uh, the copy one would be for the state tax department, um, copy two would be the recipient state copy. A and B are the um, IRS copy and the recipient copy, and then copy C is for the payer or the employer. Now, um, these ones that are like for the state or for the IRS, you know, you don't necessarily need copy one and copy A to be like printed um, or saved because those are being electronically submitted. So, like that's what the copy is called if they if there were to be a paper copy, but how um, it, it works through the software, like generally you're not actually needing those copies, but we wanted to make that available. Um, copy two and copy B. So those are for the recipient, that's for the vendor. So that's their state copy and then um, their general copy. Um, so those are what go to the vendor. And then, um, so copy C for the pair. So on top of this, so these are the reference copies, the last one is the printer sealer copy. And what this one is, is this one is used for the printing. This is gonna be on like the printer sealer, uh, it's formatted for those forms that you can print and then you know close up and send in the mail. And this contains copy two and copy B. And you'll notice those are the recipient's copy, those are the vendor's copy. So it compiled both of those different types together. So that can be provided to the vendors. And um, this is um, the standard like format for the Z fold forms, but the, this is the exact specific type of form that um, they're formatted to fit uh, for printing. Um, in addition to that, so this page like if they leave all of these vendors just over here, then it will just um, print all the vendors that qualify for the form types you've selected. If they did want to print just for one specific vendor, they could select and move that over. Um, the output file name, so it is standardly just like 1099, but if they wanted to, like if they're going to be making the different copies or anything like that, they could, um, do a custom name um, if they want to like add anything onto this, but it will default to have their district name and 1099. Um, some options like if they generate a file for both NEC and miscellaneous, that will add on to the file name. Um, if they're making correction files, that'll add a C onto there. So there are some things that add on to here, but they, they do have the ability to customize as well. Exclude vendors with no tax ID. So this is an option, you know, we looked at, you know, if they had those tax ID numbers, they do need to have a tax ID in order to 
um, be like correct, you know, when it's issued a 1099, but so it's like, if you want to exclude vendors that don't have a tax ID, make sure that they're not printed. However, if they're qualifying for a 1099 in every other way, you know, that's where the review comes in. Um, but that is an option. The organization information, so this is the district information, comes from the organization page. And then this contact uh, section is because we had set, selected that the district is going to be generating. So this is the, um, the fields available for that. And then sub submission type. So original is going to be when they first submit their 1099s. Uh, the test file we talked about. Correction is another option. And um, at this point where we're at in the checklist, they're not going to be um, using that. But we do have um, some options that we've, we added this option recently for the correction files. Um, I wanted to fit that in if we had time today, which I don't think we do, but I will tell you, um, I'm planning on adding this to the documentation. There's a section there that's not filled out currently that I'm going to get out there because um, the correction files happen like after the submission period. So you won't need that right now. You'll, if, if you run into that situation, it'll be something after January. So we'll make sure to have that documented, documented and out there with the different possible correction needs um, as well. But original is what they want to use for now. And then printing the 1099 report. So this is going to be the report that they get generate is going to be generating the type here. So at this point in our presentation, we're kind of going through the year end steps. I would say, um, you know, especially if you are having the districts, uh, you know, generate the files and then at the ITC, you're going to grab those. So I see this step as, okay, this is where um, they would want to generate probably the IRS format and then um, maybe like the printer sealer copies or the XML file if, um, you know, depending on what you're using to print. Um, these do go to, um, to the file archive. So um, right here, it's the calendar year and reports archive. You know what, let's run one of these real quick. We'll do the printer sealer. Go ahead and generate that and let those go to the archives so that we can look at them. One thing to note, um, so because I chose printer sealer, this is gonna be the forms that you would actually print for. The NEC and the miscellaneous are different formats because they're different form types. So it automatically gave me two separate files for this. And NCS labeled miscellaneous and NEC. Job scheduler. See if it's out here. Okay, so it's under the calendar year reports archive, calendar year 22. And you can see I have my miscellaneous, my NEC um, files out here. And then, um, so every time I click to run it, it does send a file out here. And I've been um, testing in here for the last couple of days too. So, uh, sorry, I have some extras. Um, but let's take a look real quick. So this is the report, um, non-employee compensation. It gives us the names, it gives us the address and our totals. And then um, let's see, lead. Oh, that's a report too, sorry. Okay. So this one is um, the sealer. That's interesting. I thought it had, I'll have to double, I'll double check with those naming conventions because I thought the names were, were um, different there. But anyways, this is what the miscellaneous form looks like. So it's got the, um, all the information here uh, as far as the recipient's information, the district information, and then um, you know the box, and this would print on your um, printer sealer. And then, let's 
here's the NEC form. So the NEC, so I have the PDF name here. I'll double check what that would be. Uh, it looks like in the file archive, the name is not showing the 1099 verse, uh, at NEC verse miscellaneous. So the other option, if they do generate those um, and then like securely send them to you, or if the district is printing those themselves, um, you know, they have those those two separate file types. Um, and then this is what the NEC looks like. All right. So here's kind of our um, just like recap as far as checklist, the checklist goes. So printing of the forms. Um, so again, that's like the XML versus the printer sealer. Submission of the 1099 data. Um, and that would be creating the tape file. And then once they have the once they have the um, calendar year end steps, once they're balanced and set to go, they can close December. Uh, they close the um, December posting period, and that will generate the other reports for the calendar year end to be sent to the reports archive, and then they can um, create January and proceed. Uh, and here's a list of the reports. Um, once December is closed, these reports will be generated. Um, now the 1099s, so they can do those as part of this process, and this is where you know it's like there is some flexibility um, because they select when they're running that 1099, 1099 extract um, which year they're running those for. So you know it's good practice to have them do that and verify that during their close process. But you know there there is some flexibility there as well, um, like after the fact, if they need to run that. Um, some of the reports and the checks, though, are much easier to do while December is still, while you're still like, currently in that year for the year-to-date totals. Okay, so then I have some additional slides here, and I know we've hit noon, so um, I think I, I kind of went a little bit more into those 1099 options where we were at before so that we kind of uh, made sure that we got that covered. Um, and then this portion is talking about, so generating the submission file, the different options there based on like if district or ITC is gonna do it. And then generating the printed forms, third party versus directly from USSR. So um, for the 1099 submissions, um, the ITC can submit the data on behalf of their districts or the districts can submit in their own. Um, so we just have a recommendation here, like especially if the ITC is going to be submitting for the district, you know, setting a deadline with your district to make sure that there's time to print those 1099 forms, return them to the district, um, and then um, combine the files and submit them to the IRS if, if you're doing that, um, and submit uh, the 1099s um, to the IRS. Return. I think that's a little bit repetitive there. <laughs> but um, so if they are submitting per district, so this is where, you know, we're talking about a lot today. And um, I wanted to go through those different options kind of all together before because you're using this 1099 extract page in multiple different ways, right? So we just looked through all of those different output files and talked about what they were all for. This is where it kind of breaks down um, in the presentation and says, okay, but for the actual submission, you want to make sure that you're doing the IRS um, format type. So this page is specific to generating that file. Um, and then kind of goes through these different um, fields. So type of return, if you're doing the NEC and the miscellaneous, check those boxes, or you could do one or the other. Your type is gonna be the IRS format. Um, we talked about the submission types um, and then printing the report or generating the file. So if the district is submitting, they can go ahead, generate this file, um, or they could download it from the um, 
calendar year and reports archive if they already ran it as part of their closing process. Uh, and then we'll have um, within the name, it's going to represent, you know, if it contains both. So for the submission file, it can contain both together because the types of the records are um, indicated on that file. And then this is where they would sign in to this fire website. This is what they get the code for. They would log in and they would submit this file, this um, TAP, we call it tape file that they've generated and submit it. So if the ITC is going to be submitting this, again, this is the IRS format. This would be generated. Um, and then this is where uh, this is what it looks like if the file is submitted by the ITC, but the district, again, can do this as part of their closing process, um, and then you can grab it from their archive or have them generate and send it to you um, securely. And um, then those files from all of the districts um, can be compiled and sent in one file by the ITC. This is where um, you'll be using that ITC management application this year. Um, and that training session is December 16th, um, and, and we are uh, definitely working on the documentation for that as well. So for printing, um, again, the XML format is for the third party software. And then if you are printing directly from USSR, um, this uh, again, like goes over the copies that will be included with that and the formatting. Now, we talked about these reference copies earlier. So again, the reference copies, you know, those are available because that would be something that like, you know, with printing, like you could choose to print those if you needed to. Generally, that's not what you're printing and sending to the vendors because they need the copy, the printer sealer copies that have both. But we made these available, like should you want to save them for your records or um, if there's something you wanna go in and, and get just a, a specific copy, like maybe you want um, the copy Cs, maybe you wanna go save the PDF of all of the copy Cs for the payer, for the employer, and have that copy available for the district. Um, there is another option uh, within the job scheduler that we made available. If you wanted to run like all of the copies at once, you could go schedule this. It's just like how the audit job um, is available in the job scheduler and just um, you would go ahead and choose this job type, all 1099 copies and put in um, a cron expression and then run that, um, that would send to the file archive. So it would go to the same place if you um, run them manually. And there are individual jobs too, if you just wanted to say like, oh, just copy C, you could do that, but that would be the same thing as like going to the 1099 extract page. So um, kind of just a preference thing. There's another option available. Okay. Okay, any questions about that, about the um, printing part there? I know um, with some kind of some new options, we kind of, you know, slid those into the existing um, uh, process. So I talked about it there, but I wanted to include some steps at the end too that were a little bit more specific. So, so yeah, let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, as you, you know, as you go through to, as always, you can always put in a ticket and let us know. Um, we do have some upcoming uh, training sessions that I have listed on here. So uh, December 2nd, we'll be uh, talking about the review of November releases like we do each month. Um, December 9th, we have a session for receipts and refunds. And so we're going to kind of focus in on um, some different like FAQs, tips and tricks uh, related to uh, those two types of transactions. We don't talk about those a whole lot. So um, I think that'll be an interesting one. And then December 16th, we're going to um, meet back again to talk more specifically about that ITC management application. So if you are compiling the files to um, submit to the IRS for your districts, you'll be using that. Um, that is basically like the replacement for like the classical pen. Um, 
And so the registration, um, to get to the registration links, those are here. And um, again, a link to our calendar year end materials. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for attending today. I'm so sorry that we went over um, went over the time. Um, but you know, if you do need to review anything again, we have that recording. We'll get that out there as soon as we can. And uh, thank you so much. I hope I hope you all have a great have a great day. Thanks, Amanda. Have a good day. Thank you.